Good evening, friends. Uh, thank you, Lori. Um, uh, Lori has been a friend since she was a star pupil of mine uh, uh, some years ago. I've actually known her husband even longer when he was just a, a, a little guy uh, when I went to um, his dad's church in North Philadelphia. So it's, um, it's good to be back with um, both of you and um, to be with this uh, class. I was uh, reminded as I listened to the earlier presentations of what a very special place Eastern University is. Uh, I've actually been a part of Palmer Seminary, which is the theological schools, for um, 34 years now. Uh, and um, uh, I just heard in the statements that were made this wonderful combination uh, of um, deep commitment to Christ, uh, commitment to excellence in learning and a commitment to justice. So it's been great to be a part of that. I'm delighted to be a, a part of uh, this uh, special program that uh, you all are involved in. And I was invited to uh, uh, talk about a totally irrelevant topic given the uh, moment in time we're in, uh, thinking biblically about politics. Now just because you're a good Christian doesn't mean you get your politics right. Uh, and I, I won't refer to current um, candidates to illustrate that, but uh, just two examples. Um, uh, Jesse Helms, um, some of you are old enough to remember, was um, a very, very prominent pro-life uh, senator. He uh, happened to come from the state of um, uh, North Carolina, uh, which uh, is the largest tobacco growing state uh, in the country. And he supported the government subsidies for tobacco growers, even supported using government money to ship our tobacco, abro tobacco products abroad under the Food for Peace program. Not, I would suggest, a completely pro-life or a consistently pro-life agenda. Uh, just to be an equal opportunity critic, uh, uh, another story, this is about Miguel de Scotto. Uh, Miguel de Scotto was a Mary Noel priest. Uh, he was also a Nicaraguan, and when the Sandinistas took over Nicaragua, he became the foreign minister. I met him a couple times on trips there. I certainly respect him as a, a Christian. But he was uh, pretty deeply committed to um, uh, at least a semi-Marxist uh, kind of agenda that the Sandinistas had. And about 1987, he went to the Soviet Union, accepted the Lenin Peace Prize, and gave speeches around the Soviet Union saying that the Soviet Union was the last great hope for Earth. Not entirely perceptive uh, as late as 1987. So just because you're a good Christian doesn't mean you get your politics right. Well, we all know that, that Christians are up to our ears in, in politics. You can see it um, in all kinds of um, places. You can see it Falwell's Moral Majority in the 80s, or Pat Robertson's Christian Coalition in the 90s, or the massive uh, evangelical, white evangelical support for uh, George W. Bush uh, in the last, um, uh, in the 2000 to uh, 2008, uh, or in the black church's political engagement, or uh, Jim Wallace and Sojourner's political engagement. Uh, Christians are up to our ears in politics, both here and around the world. In fact, um, uh, in the last uh, 15 or so years, there have been a whole bunch of uh, evangelical presidents um, throughout the developing world, in uh, Guatemala and South Korea and um, um, uh, Zambia, and uh, on and on. And I could illustrate um, the ways that uh, sometimes that didn't work out terribly well, but um, I'll um, uh, not spend a lot of time on that except to say that uh, I found it intriguing when Ralph Reed, uh, remember he was the, the very bright uh, young uh, um, guy who headed up the Christian Coalition for Pat Robertson, and um, he was really good uh, at what he did. Uh, he pointed out in his book, Active Faith, that uh, when he became an evangelical Christian, it didn't change his politics because he said, I'd already made up my mind on that. Now, I find that interesting. Uh, either there was a perfect meshing of conservative Republican political agendas and evangelical faith, or he wasn't thinking entirely clearly. I leave it up to you. But Ed Dobson, who was uh, Jerry Falwell's vice president of Moral Majority, 
and then uh, left um, Dobson and was uh, left um, uh, Falwell and was somewhat critical. He said that uh, they didn't think through carefully a systematic approach to political engagement. He said the um, approach was ready, fire, aim. And I think what one has to say is that at least for white evangelicals, uh, we jumped into politics without a very careful, systematic effort to think through on biblical grounds and on systematic grounds how we ought to do that. And the result was, um, I think, inconsistency um, of all kinds. Um, you know, one illustration is simply with regard to the sanctity of human life. Uh, virtually all evangelicals um, are committed to quite a strong belief that um, every individual human being is inestimably precious, um, made in the image of God. And the sanctity of human life is a crucial part of that. But so often, in the last few decades, uh, those same people were primarily concerned uh, with abortion, as if, uh, as some wags suggested, life uh, begins at conception and ends at birth. As if uh, people dying of hunger or people dying of tobacco smoke uh, is not also a pro-life issue. So, we're engaged in politics. We haven't done it uh, uh, we haven't thought through a systematic, careful approach to doing it. And what should we do? Well, some people say, let's forget it. You know, we made mistakes, we were used, um, uh, we did it badly. Uh, let's just forget politics. It's too messy, too complicated, um, and so on. Uh, I say no, absolutely no, for two reasons. One practical and one theological. The practical is that it's a simple historical fact that political decisions affect the lives of literally billions of people. The political decisions by the American Congress and the American President truly affect the lives of billions of people in this world. Think of the agony the world would have been spared if German Christians had not helped elect Hitler to political office. Think of the goodness and wholeness that emerged because that evangelical politician in England, William Wilberforce, worked for 30 years and eventually persuaded the British Parliament to outlaw first the slave trade and then slavery itself in the British Empire. It was through politics that country after country has become more democratic. Uh, it is through politics that country after country has embraced religious freedom for everyone. It is through politics that the Marxists in the Soviet Union took over and deeply uh, harmed and then uh, lost power uh, in the Soviet Union. It's through politics that we develop laws that either restrict or permit abortion, that allow or forbid gay marriage, that protect or destroy the environment. All of those things happen through politics. Politics is simply too important to ignore. And the theological reason for not ignoring politics is even more important. Our basic Christian confession is that Christ is Lord. Lord now. Revelation says that he is ruler of the kings of the earth. Now. Jesus said at the resurrection, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Since that's who he is, we must allow him to be lord of our politics. And since we live in a democratic society, how we vote, or even our failure to vote, shapes what happens. So Christians, confessing Christ as Lord, need to be engaged politically. But how do we do it? Is there a method? And that's what I want to briefly talk about tonight. I'd like to basically do four things kind of quickly. First of all, I want to give you an overview of how I try to approach thinking about politics. Secondly, I want to briefly sketch what I call my normative biblical framework. 
for thinking about politics. Then third, I want to briefly sketch my political philosophy. And finally, I want to make a few comments about um, the current um, scene. Every political judgment, whether you realize it or not, whether people realize it or not, has basically four components. There is, first of all, some normative framework. Some understanding of what justice is, what human, who, who human beings are, and so on. And second, there is a broad study of society. And third, there is what I call a political philosophy, a roadmap, a summary of those two things. And finally, there's an application of that political philosophy to the concrete piece of legislation or to the current election. Let me just briefly talk about each of those. First of all, the normative framework. If anybody tries to tell you that they've got some neutral, objective, scientific, whatever, approach to politics, it's not grounded in religious belief or philosophical belief, uh, don't believe them for a minute. They're either trying to kid you or themselves. Even uh, John Rawls, who used to claim that, uh, no longer does. In fact, uh, every political judgment is based on some set of normative judgments. You need a normative framework. And I want to get those primarily from the scriptures. Now, it's not a simple matter of proof texting. You don't just uh, put your finger down and find a text here and there and you've got your biblical framework. You have to do careful exegesis. You have to look at the whole biblical story from creation, fall, redemption, and the return of Christ. And uh, then you also need to look at uh, what the Bible says about specific um, issues like the nature of persons, about the nature of justice, and so on. I call those biblical paradigms. So the biblical story and biblical paradigms together provide me with what I call my normative biblical framework. But second, you also need a broad study of the world. I've never found any text that tells us whether or not we ought to build uh, nuclear power plants or um, how seven billion people in the world affects, affects the environment. We've got to study economics um, and history and politics and sociology and do our good homework. And then third, we need a political philosophy. Why? Well, because every time you want to make a political decision, you can't spend uh, a few days, actually a few years, going back and studying all the relevant biblical texts to get your normative division. And you can't spend another five years studying history and politics and society. You have to have a handy roadmap, a handy guide. And that's what a political philosophy is. It should come from your normative vision, mine is, I hope, grounded in the scriptures, and on the other, your careful ongoing study of history and society. But you need that political philosophy. And then fourth, you need a fourth step, you have to apply it. You have to look right now at Mr. Romney and Mr. Obama's um, platforms uh, and what you think they'll do, regardless of what they say, uh, and uh, make a decision about uh, which fits better with the political philosophy that you've developed out of your normative vision and your broad study of the world. One other introductory point, and that's it, this. I think it's crucial that we Christians start our thinking about politics within the Christian community. If we don't, we'll simply buy some secular political philosophy. And I think Christians in the last number of decades have done precisely that. They've bought left-wing or right-wing politics rather than being profoundly biblical. I think the result has been a sub-Christian religious right that I believe rightly, largely, championed the family and the sanctity of human life. But it neglected economic justice for the poor, uncritically endorsed American nationalism, ignored environmental concern for God's creation, and neglected the struggle against racism. I think equally sub-Christian was a religious left that rightly defended justice and peace and the integrity of creation, but then forgot about the importance of the family and sexual integrity, sometimes uncritically endorsed Marxism, uh, overlooked the fact that freedom is just as important as justice, and failed to defend the most vulnerable, the unborn.
So we need to start within the Christian community, think through our approach to politics, and then move into political engagement. Well, let me next um, show you how I develop what I call a normative biblical framework. And uh, uh, you know, all of this is, is, is just very quickly sketching what's a much larger task. Uh, over at the book table, the ESA uh, table, I've got uh, my new book, Just Politics, and I'm just giving you a quick summary of that if you want to get a longer um, summary of it. The biblical story is a crucial part of how I develop my normative biblical framework. The biblical story tells us about the importance of persons. It tells us about where history is going. Uh, all of that is absolutely crucial. But then secondly, the other part of the biblical framework is what I call biblical paradigms. I want to know what the Bible tells us about the nature of persons, about justice, and so on. So let me illustrate a few of those. And first of all, the special dignity and sanctity of every human being. Every person and only human beings are made in the image of God, called to stewardship of the non-human creation, made to find fulfillment only when rightly related to God, to the neighbor, and to the earth, and summoned to respond in freedom to God's invitation of salvation, and invited, in fact, to live forever in the presence of the risen Lord. Now, I think we should act on the belief that from the moment of conception, we are dealing with a human life. There's no extended biblical passage that says that. There's certainly no biblical passage that suggests the other. There are biblical passages that use the words for the born, for the baby that is born, um, and applies it to the unborn child. For 19 centuries, the Christian church has been overwhelmingly opposed to abortion. Now, if you're not sure when a, the fetus becomes a human being, then it seems to me we ought to act on the assumption that, in fact, from the moment of conception, we're dealing with a human being. Otherwise, it's like shooting into a darkened theater and saying, I hope I hit chairs and not people. Second, freedom of belief. Now, I know there are Old Testament passages that uh, don't exactly embrace religious freedom. Uh, but there's also this amazing story of the way God, decade after decade, uh, gives space and freedom to the people of Israel to say no to him or to say yes to him. Amazing religious freedom. And Jesus, of course, um, tells the parable of the wheat and tares and says, allow the tares to grow until the end of history. The field is the society and there's supposed to be freedom for tares as well as wheat to grow there. Or the family. Strong, stable families, persons related by blood, marriage or adoption uh, are what the Bible tells us about family, keeping marriage vows, accepting God's design that sexual intercourse be reserved for marriage between a man and a woman. All of those, I think, are part of what the Bible tells us about marriage. Or justice, biblical paradigm of justice. There are two key Hebrew words, mishpat and zedekah, translate them righteousness and justice. And those two words refer both to fair courts and to fair economic outcomes. If I had time, I could um, spend a lot of um, uh, time talking about that just very quickly. Go back to the Old Testament. Agricultural society, land is the basic capital. What happens? The government doesn't own it all, and certainly a few wealthy people don't own it all. Every family gets their own land. And then God says every 50 years, the Jubilee, the land goes back to the original owners. And then the prophets shout and scream when, under the kings, they, um, the wealthy uh, seize the land of poor farmers so they can't care for their families anymore. And they say that when the Messiah comes in that future time, then every person will sit under his own vine and fig tree. Everybody gets their land back. So I think the basic principle there about economic justice is that God wants every person and every family to have access to the productive resources so that if they act responsibly, they can earn their own way and be dignified members of their community. If I had time, I'd talk about um, 
another biblical paradigm, a special concern for the poor. Hundreds of verses. God measures societies by what they do to the people at the bottom. But you get a little picture of how I'm trying to go back to the scriptures, look at the, in principle, I'd like to look at every relevant text in the Old Testament and the New, and then develop uh, what I call a canonical biblical paradigm on each of these and other topics. So that normative biblical framework is a, uh, a crucial part. But then, uh, thirdly, we have to develop a political philosophy. And as I say, that grows out of our normative framework and our very careful, sustained study of the world. Let me just illustrate my political philosophy in a few areas. First of all, the democratization and decentralization of power. There's a negative reason and a positive reason for decentralizing power. The positive reason is that the Creator wants all of us, you and me, to be co-workers with God in shaping history. If all the decisions are made by a few people at the top, you and I can't do what the Creator wants us to do. But there's a negative reason. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. In a sinful world, if you have centralized power that's unchecked, you can almost guarantee that it will result in injustice. So to avoid totalitarianism and injustice, we need to decentralize power. That's one of the reasons why democracy, I think, is a good idea. Because, um, now it doesn't work terribly well, but when it works properly, we've got, with one person, one vote, an enormous decentralization of power. And another example of this decentralization of power is when you get a whole bunch of non-governmental institutions. A good society is not composed of just individuals and the state. You've got uh, churches and families and businesses and educational institutions and all kinds of nonprofits, all of them largely independent of the state. And those, they decentralize power and they promote freedom. Or take another area, another part of my political philosophy, uh, private ownership in a market economy. I think that on balance, the best approach that we know toward the economic order is private ownership um, and wages set largely by supply, supply and demand. A communist society where the government owns all the means of production, tries to set all the prices, um, just doesn't work very well. It's not very efficient. Uh, and it doesn't promote freedom. Now, if you're concerned about centralized power, you ought to say no to a Marxist approach, but it seems to me you ought to equally be concerned about huge corporations which have enormous centralized power. And when huge corporations uh, own the media, um, that, uh, and those same small groups of people uh, give most of the money for elections, you obviously got a dangerous centralization of power again. So a concern for justice and freedom will be concerned to decentralize power everywhere, in politics and in the economy. Uh, if you had time, I'd talk about the family, I'd talk about the care for creation and a sustainable planet uh, or the role of government. That's uh, a hot topic right now. We can come back to that. I want to leave a little time for discussion so you can ask about that if you want to. One final area, a consistent ethic of life. I think the first and most basic right is the inviolable right to life. And I think government ought to protect that. So as I suggested earlier, uh, I'm opposed um, to abortion on demand. Um, I would uh, favor more restrictions um, on abortion. I think we also must be clear that there are two persons involved, not one. It's not just the baby, it's also the mother. And so we, if we're pro-life, we better be concerned with the mother and provide economic opportunity and better um, adoption possibilities, etc., etc. Similarly, I think uh, euthanasia uh, is wrong. But, as I said, life doesn't begin at conception and end at birth. Uh, when you get millions and millions of people dying of starvation or diseases we know how to prevent, surely that's a pro-life issue. Uh, when you get um, many millions of people dying of tobacco smoke every year, surely that's a pro-life issue. Um, similarly, it seems to me, capital punishment is a pro-life issue. We need to have a consistent approach 
to our understanding of the sanctity of human life. Well, that's very quickly, very, very briefly, um, uh, an illustration of how I try to use the normative biblical framework and a careful study of history to put together a political philosophy. Uh, one final set of comments, actually two different parts to it. Uh, the one is that I think it's absolutely crucial that if we're going to be Christians in politics, we have a biblically balanced agenda. I said earlier that I largely agreed with what the religious right, largely, agreed with what the religious right was saying about the sanctity of human life and marriage. But I regularly said, your agenda is not biblical enough. It's not broad enough. Because if you want to be biblical in your politics, you have to ask the question, what does the Bible tell us God cares about? And it's pretty clear when you ask that question, God cares about the sanctity of human life and the poor. He cares about the family and racial justice. God cares about uh, sexual integrity and the care for creation and peacemaking and so on. And so that biblically balanced agenda, it seems to me, is absolutely crucial for a Christian in politics. one final set of comments, and that is about the quite substantial change that's going on in the white evangelical world with regard to politics. Now, it's not fast enough or uh, sweeping as I would like to see it, but there's a very interesting change going on. And it's a move to a broader agenda that's much broader than what the religious right was promoting. It started uh, in the 90s uh, when uh, evangelicals became quite engaged on some international issues of human rights. The International Religious Freedom um, um, Act, uh, for example, was pushed very much uh, by evangelicals, and then sexual trafficking. Kristen, I think, w was talking with you about that um, earlier today. Um, and then um, Darfur and um, South Sudan, to the point where um, the, uh, the uh, New York Times columnist Nick Kristof began to talk about in new evangelical internationalism. And then uh, in 2004, the National Association of Evangelicals, which is the largest, um, um, largely white evangelical network in the country, about 30 million people represented, uh, that group adopted uh, a, a statement for the health of the nations, 12 pages long, and basically, it's a clear rejection of the narrow agenda of the religious right. And it says that faithful evangelical civic engagement must have a biblically balanced agenda. And uh, then it goes on to have chapters, yes, on abortion, not chapters, but sections on abortion and marriage, but also on the longest one is on economic justice um, and uh, environmental uh, issues and peacemaking and so on. And that's now the unanimously adopted official position of the largest evangelical organization in the country. A friend of mine, Dave Gushing, uh, has written a book basically saying that the evangelical center is abandoning uh, the religious right and is embracing this broader, what I call a biblically balanced agenda. And it's especially true of, of evangelical youth who are embracing that agenda. Now, if you compare this new document that I've referred to with Catholic social teaching, you'll find almost total overlap, almost total agreement. You have to look very hard for differences. Um, Protestants um, don't think birth control you know, is wrong. Um, Catholic teaching says it is. but. You know, it, it's only a, a few small areas of that sort. Overwhelmingly, they very much agree. And those two communities, the Catholic and uh, evangelical communities in the country, um, represent half of the voters in the country. You add a large number of African Americans and Hispanics that are also, I think, committed to that broad agenda, and you have more than a majority of voters. If we would figure out how to work together in the next 10 and 20 years, we could change American politics. We could force both the Democrats and the Republicans to have better agendas.
I'm going to stop right there. Um, I haven't specifically talked about the current election, uh, but uh, we have a few minutes, sorry, to uh, uh, take some uh, questions. Yeah. People have disagreed with me in the past. It doesn't destroy me, so feel free. <laughs> what are your uh, thoughts and questions? I'll repeat the question for the for the uh, camera. I mean, it's a good idea. How do you deal with it now? It's a good idea, he says. Um, but how do you deal with it now? Uh, the answer is with difficulty, um, <laughs> because uh, it's probably fairly clear that. Um, if you take what I've just said and apply it to the stated platforms of the Republican and Democratic parties and their, um, their leaders, that uh, some of it fits better with the Republican agenda and some of it fits better with the Democratic agenda. Um, I don't happen to think that that comes out to a 50-50, uh, but um, I won't tell you how I, how I dice that or how I um, cut that since I haven't in, publicly endorsed a presidential candidate since 1972 when I organized a group called Evangelicals for McGovern. Uh, but I know how I'm going to vote. Uh, and it seems to me what you have to do is to take the whole agenda and say which of these two candidates and their platforms is closer on balance to the bulk of that agenda. And then you vote. Um, there have been times when I've um, been even uncertain how to vote. Uh, once in the last 20 years I wasn't sure how I was going to vote until I got into the, uh, into the booth. Um, I'm not that uncertain this year. But uh, uh, it seems to me that's how you do it. And it's never crystal clear. You know, it's, it's sometimes wrenching. Other questions? Yeah. You spoke about care of creation. How do you see ecotheology starting to play a part in evangelical uh, society? Like, how do you, uh, have you seen more of that role of uh, ecotheology or care of creation coming yeah. into? Yeah, the. Can you repeat it? The question is um, about. Uh, the environment and uh, creation, care of creation, and has uh, there been a change in the evangelical community uh, uh, on that? Uh, the answer is yes, um, um, amazingly so. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, next spring, uh, I um, uh, was part of the National Religious Partnership in the Environment that brought together uh, a Catholic environmental organization, it was actually the U.S. Catholic bishops, National Council of Churches, a Jewish coalition, and there wasn't an evangelical partner, and so Evangelicals for Social Action said, we'll put it together. And we created the Evangelical Environmental Network. And for a while it was very heavy sledding, uh, there was just not a lot of concern in the white evangelical community on this issue. Um, and, uh, but, but slowly, that's, that's built and developed in the last five, six years. It's really developed in a major way. So there's now a lot more concern there, a lot more uh, public engagement. I could, I could go on to some length on that. Uh, uh, Stan LaCroix was the first uh, staff person of the Evangelical Environmental Network uh, uh, almost uh, uh, 20 years ago now. Yes? Um, I'm, just, I'm curious about... Um a little louder. Yeah. Um, so you didn't speak much about like immigrants and non-Christians. So I'm guess I'm curious about how those. Um, what's your view on what the political agenda is in reference to how we treat them? Yeah. Um, I, I I hear two issues. One is the question of immigration. The other is the question of um, um, the fact that we've got a pluralistic society and. Um, not nearly everybody in the society is Christian, although vast majority say they're Christian, 80% or so still. Um, and so how, you, how do you do that? Well, first of all, you respect religious freedom. Uh, and we decided to do that as a nation. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so we genuinely welcome um, uh, uh, everybody of every religious faith into the political debate. 
Now, that doesn't mean that Christians shouldn't develop political platforms that grow out of their deepest faith commitments, uh, but we should respect everybody and encourage everybody to do that. And, and uh, in terms of what happens, uh, you know, it'll be the democratic process that decides uh, you know, what gets enacted into law. Um, the, the, the separate question of immigration, um, you know, I'm, I'm very much in favor of immigration reform, um, of, um, you know, a, a path to citizenship for the um, undocumented um, people who are here, and, and so on. Is that getting at your question? Yeah, I just wanted to know your thoughts on it. It really wasn't a question at all. I just really wanted to know your thoughts on mm -hmm. those two issues. I have a thought, um, a question for you about, uh, I guess, just democracy, the voting process, and representation. Mm -hmm. So, my understanding of the U.S. Constitution is that it's supposed to be a government for the people, by the people, and so we're, you know, we call our leaders our representatives. So, when the different leaders are campaigning for leadership, um, I guess the 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 um, difference that I see is, on the one hand, we want them to talk to us about what do you feel this country needs in order to be in a good place, but at the same time they're supposed to be representatives of the voters, and the voters have a wide variety of what they think is, mm -hmm. is best done. So I guess my question for you is how do you, th what are some ways that, um, I guess we can, or just ways you can envision us creating the space for um, our leaders to be open and honest about what they truly feel is best mm -hmm. while still being true to being representative of the people they're claiming to represent. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's important. I mean, the, the question is, what about representative government? Um, and uh, the, the tension between um, our politicians simply testing the wind and, and asking, what do my people currently want? And on the other hand, being courageous leaders and saying, here's a problem, and we've got to deal with it. Uh, we need a lot more of the second. Um, we're in a pretty serious uh, political uh, gridlock uh, at this moment, which is fundamentally dangerous to our economic future. Um, and we ought to, uh, there's a sense in which finally, you know, we're responsible um, as, as citizens. If, if we were large numbers of us demanding that our politicians really deal honestly and clearly with the major issues um, and that they cooperate with people across the aisle, you know, then we would get, we would get beyond the gridlock. But um, part of the problem is that uh, both parties are becoming more ideological um, and the primaries uh, are controlled by the most ideological members of each party. And so uh, we get, um, with some frequency, um, uh, more extreme uh, representatives uh, on both sides. But in the long run, we get what, what we're willing to vote for. I mean, if, 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 there, was a, if there were a sustained Christian movement uh, over um, 10 and 20 years that demanded uh, more integrity, more civility, um, more grappling with major issues, more willingness uh, to um, uh, work across the aisle, you know, uh, we'd get more politicians like that. You mentioned these three segments of society, uh, Catholics and, and Evangelicals and, and, uh, and minorities having a, a similar uh, political viewpoint or potential view, uh, yeah. similar viewpoint. How do you get, or how do you propose that you get, two spiritual enemies to talk? We've got Evangelicals who think that Catholics are horrible and that they're the mother church and they really have to change their mind. And you have Catholics who look at Protestants as those children who left the mother church. And they're not sort of yeah. children at all. Yeah. The question is about uh, whether or not Catholics and Protestants with a long history of, of um, not just disagreement, but, but nasty name-calling and vicious, <laughs> even, even wars, um, can work together. Well, the truth is there's been enormous change on that issue in the last 30 years, and especially in the last um, uh, 20 and 15 years. It's partly that um, 
uh, Catholics and Protestants have worked together on specific issues. Uh, initially it was abortion, uh, uh, more recently marriage issues, uh, sexuality, but increasingly questions of poverty and, and so on. And I don't think that's a problem anymore, frankly. Now, maybe at, at some grassroots levels there's still enormous hostility, but in terms of the religious leaders of both communities, um, that's, that's no longer a problem. Frankly, I think there's a bigger problem uh, between um, uh, white evangelicals uh, and the black church. Theologically and in terms of, you know, uh, the spirit, uh, there, there are no two groups closer than African American Christians and, and white evangelicals in terms of, of biblical commitments uh, and so on. But white evangelicals at best were silent when King was marching uh, and often were opposed um, and uh, uh, bought into racist politics in the last 30 years uh, and African Americans are not about to vote for um, somebody, you know, making uh, semi-subtle, you know, racial appeals. Um, if white evangelicals would really get the whole agenda, which is what now officially is their position, which includes racial justice and economic justice um, uh, and so on, um, then I think you would see what I believe is really the case, namely that I, I think the black church is um, just as committed to the sanctity of human life uh, and to a traditional understanding of marriage um, as white evangelicals. Um, but um, they certainly, the black church certainly won't vote um, for um, uh, people who don't seem to care about economic justice. But if we had the whole agenda, then it seems to me there would be large numbers of the black church and the Latino church, as well as Catholics and, and white evangelicals, that could agree on this completely pro-life agenda. But it'll take a heck of a lot of work and a lot of mending of fences and a lot of repentance <laughs> on the part of white evangelicals. How does a, a Christian politician juggle um, their own spiritual compass with the need to represent the people who voted for him. For example, if um, a Christian politician believed in the sanctity of marriage but represents a population of gay and lesbian, how do they um, support their own belief but yet support the people who they're supposed to represent and how do they legislate that fear and balance need for representation both sides? Yeah, uh, it's another question uh, on the um the tension between representing your constituents and standing up for what you believe. I think that on important issues, politicians ought to honestly tell us what they think is right. Um, we, after all, our understanding of representative government is not that every person has a button and votes on every issue. We elect people that we take to be, hopefully, <coughs> wise um, and uh, intelligent and ask them to represent us and to make good decisions. And that includes uh, sometimes saying, uh, here, I think this is the way we should go, even though some of my people don't agree with that. Um, that's what I think we ought to do on, on, on a whole uh, range of issues. Obviously, if you're from a district where the um, majority of people uh, are gay or lesbian or um, you know, think that that's an appropriate, um, that, that gay practice is, is fine and we ought to have gay marriage, then you probably won't get elected. Um, you know, that's just the nature of democratic uh, uh, politics. Yeah? Yeah, um, I just had a question about the nature of church and state separation. Oh, tell us. Yeah, this is the last question. Sorry, sorry, Lori. Uh, the separation of church and state and how that plays in on issues like homosexual marriage, whether right. it's in the church or on the federal level, or even issues of peace, as whether Christians should be peace or what, you know how we perceive it, or whether that should be a federal agenda as well, and how separation of church and state. Yeah, the question is, how does separation of church and state play into a whole range of issues, uh, and, and gay marriage? Uh, uh, and on and on, um, you know, in a minute. <laughs> uh, 
uh, we should not legislate specific aspects of Christian doctrine. Uh, I think there's a a, 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 a purely uh, quote secular uh, argument that is compelling um, to say that um, all civilizations that we've known have thought that marriage is between a man and a woman and that the fundamental interest of government in marriage is the next generation of stable citizens and wholesome citizens and the sociological data is overwhelmingly clear that it's better for children to grow up with their biological moms and dads. Um, I think that's a case to be made um, quite apart from what the Bible says about sexual practice. And that's the way I would argue um, that particular issue in terms of, of uh, public policy. I don't think it's a church-state issue at all. Thank you. Sorry to go over, going over time, Laurie.